You're listening to The Building Code. I'm Tom Houghton. Hello, Tom. I'm Paul Worth. Seasonal greetings to you, Paul, <laughs> on this new year. The new year, I'm going to do the intro different every time. Just to see if I can throw you off. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would welcome that okay, for the whole good. year. All right. It's a on. whole year of new intros coming your way. It's on. It's 2020. That's right. On this episode of The Building Code, we're joined by Christine Ross of Edition Building and Design, based in Sherman Oaks, California. Welcome, Christine. Hi. Thank Hello. you, guys. <laughs> Thanks for having us. You, you told us right before we jumped on that, unfortunately, during this time of year, you're not taking advantage of, of California. You're actually in Ohio. I am. I the love the snow, but it's not really snowing here. It's a green Christmas this year. So, yes, my kids and I were talking about that and only Midwest people, I think. Well, maybe maybe mid, only Midwest people, but it's kind of a bummer if it's just cold. Right. Yeah. No, no snow. snow. Mm-hmm. Like if it's going to be cold, give me the snow. Yep. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I'm like, what's the point of my suffering if it's not going to be pretty? Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's one of those seasons or one of those years. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, Christine, we always like to start off with our guests getting to know a little bit about their company. So maybe give us a background okay. of addition building and design. Great. So addition building and design, we're a, we're a design build firm. We're based in Los Angeles. Um, my dad started the company 40 years ago in Ohio. And um, I worked for, with him since I like, could remember. I mean, I used to have cereal with him when I was in grade school, uh, when he'd be starting the scheduling. Mm. And then as I got older into high school, I would ha- work in the offices and um, work with uh, pricing out different things, windows and doors and siding and things like that. And um, as I got older, I had my own company doing other things in a different industry. And then I was like, I really miss it. I miss design. I love building. And so... Um, about six years ago, my dad's like, all right, come on in. So I came in and, um, so we do a lot of large scale home build outs. So a lot of Malibu, Pacific Palisades, Studio City, Bel Air, Beverly Hills. Um, you'll see a lot of our projects there and a lot of large scale additions and remodels, like 600 to 10,000 square feet, I guess, is about where we usually are at with our project sizes. Awesome. That's a, yeah, that's really cool. it's really fun. I love it. Yeah, I love the design part. So it's good. It's nice I love being on site, like making sure the foundation and framing is is perfect. That's part of the job. So, how would you describe your role in the business? What do you do day to day? So, I handle the sales and project management. So, my daily job, I go to visit the job sites and make sure everything's going smoothly. Um, for doing foundation, framing, plumbing, or electrical rough in, or on the finish work. I make sure everything is according to plan and done correctly. Um, and also I do a lot of the interviews, the marketing. Um, I work a lot with our staff. We've got a full staff in the office. So make sure that our uh, relationships with our subcontractors and all of our vendors are going well. And, you know, we, we've had these relationships with people for, you know, 20 years. So it's really important that they're always going smoothly and everyone's happy. That's, That's awesome. Great. Yeah. So, so you, um, you, you, you get, you mentioned like interviews, so marketing, social media, you have a pretty good Instagram following. Is that something that you oversee? It is. I, I have it on my phone. So I try to, I try to take pictures as I'm going. I'm just, I'm on so many job sites every day and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I gotta take a picture. You know, so I'll get a great shot of my dad with a client. I think like one I just got like a couple weeks ago is a beautiful shot of my dad and a client, um, looking over the, the wooded property on like the third level of her deck, you know, I try to get like really meaningful photos, things that show like how we interact with our clients and we stay really close with them. That makes sense. Yeah. So you, you, you had mentioned you're in LA and, and Beverly Hills and Malibu and obviously those are areas that people know about, obviously they're mm-hmm. higher end areas, but they also probably have their own challenges. What are some of the unique things about building in California? So the building codes are strict when it comes to green building. Addition building and design, we've always been on the cutting edge of green building. I, I, it's always important to me, not only in building sustainably, but giving back like um, Habitat for Humanity. If we take out all the cabinets, I want to make sure that those cabinets are going to someone who need. Mm-hmm. Um, but it basically, you have a, a lot of fire resistant codes that you need to keep up with, which is um, certain materials, um, hardy boards, cement tiles, clay tiles, um, no wood fi- wood burning fireplaces at all, whether in your a uh, high fire risk, risk zone or not. Um, what else is there? There's fire sprinklers. If you're mm-hmm. touching um, 
60% or higher of the house, you have to put in a whole new fire sprinkler system, uh, which is a really big deal. Um, dual pane tempered glass and windows, uh, windows and doors, uh, no decks. That's another thing. Um, use composite product for decking and anything that's wood, obviously, on the property. So, so it, things like that. Yeah, it, it seems like everything, not everything, a lot of it's surrounded surrounded around the fires that we've heard about in and around your area. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with that over the last six months to a year and sort of what maybe a fire resistant home looks like beyond the things you just mentioned? So um, fire resistant, it's, you're going to see just a lot more cement, I guess. Um, Ooh, attractive. If you're trying to build prettier <laughs> cement products, <laughs> yeah. they're trying to build prettier cement tiles. Um, you know, they're trying, there's hardy board, there's cement walls, which, but cement walls are very expensive, so yeah. it's still wood framing, but the hardy board and the outside. Mainly, it's like getting the client to like the design of the fire-resistant materials they have to use. Mm -hmm. um, landscaping, putting a lot of um, putting cement around the whole house, like three to four feet out from the wall. Um, let's see what else we have. Oh, the the overhangs are stuccoed, so mm -hmm. when you look up, everything's closed in. Once the fire gets up into your attic, it's done so you got to make sure that you're keeping that from happening um and just homeowners they they are they're not really liking the cement around the house so we have to kind of make it pretty make it a pattern things like that yeah it, it seems like if everything was fire resistant it would be very much like a post a cop apocalyptic uh, yeah. type looking vibe yeah <laughs> like <insurgent. laughs> it'd be like the cyber truck it would yeah just yeah. steal and Steel and yeah, and so so the, there's probably an opportunity for manufacturers to make appealing, aesthetically appealing, oh. uh, you know, fire resistant type stuff, right? And even like green, like there's um, saving water. So we have a mm -hmm. like a lot of the the um, water bins. Like when there's going to be, we're saving the water that pours off the house. I mean, right. it's so ugly. I mean, the, the homeowners hate them. Mm -hmm. They're these ugly, huge water bins right in front of their house, like right in the front yard. And they're like, why do I have to have this? And I'm so sorry. It's code. And they're like, it's so ugly. I have this beautiful home. And then you have the mm -hmm. water barrels like right in front of the house. I, and there's only one company that makes them and they're all the same. And I'm like, no, we really should like make some beautiful water barrels. You yeah. can bury some of them, but they're a lot more expensive and they're already in excess expense for the homeowner. So they're not, once you already know that you have to do that, they're like, I'm not going to spend even more on like burying it. Right. So yeah, that makes sense. So with the recent fires, do you feel like there's more regulation coming down the pike for your area or is all this still in place right now? It's, um, it's pretty strict right now. Mm -hmm. I don't see how they could really make it more strict. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, especially with fire sprinklers. I think that what's happening is that homeowners are becoming, um, they're actually like being more creative. Mm -hmm. So homeowners will be like, can I put fire sprinklers on the exterior of my home? Sure. We put them on the roof all the time. We put them on their garages, um, outside. Uh, we make sure that the their landscaping is far away from the house. So they can't really have bushes and things like very close because once that catches fire, it can jump over to the house. But they're actually getting creative, which I'm. I like. I like a lot that they like to collaborate with us on how to make things work for them. Awesome, thinking outside the box there. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, in 2019, there were fires in Malibu. There are fires mm -hmm. in the Thousand Oaks area, mm -hmm. um, kind of all over. And then now, even, well, and by now, this will be two weeks ago. But uh, Australia and Sydney, there's tons of fires mm -hmm. there that are affecting a lot of houses. So fires yeah. is something that I think we're going to see more trouble with going forward. Um, yeah. And I guess, how do you approach that with your customers as, as your, like, is this a talking point during the sales process? Like, how, how does that conversation go? Well, usually a home that we're redoing now lately will have been, unfortunately, burnt down. Um, but when it's a new home build and it's not really in a fire, there, I, for example, I had a client in Studio City. He's not really in a fire zone, but he was concerned about it. He's like, you know, my shingles are wood. You know, that's obviously very dangerous. So I was like, you know, let's do like a Euro Shield shingle. It looks really beautiful. And so, um, the, you know, it costs more money. But once I show them, it's going to look great and they don't have to worry about it. It's good for the environment. They're 
LA, it's, it's, it's easier to sell these type of products to clients there. Everyone's really into being friendlier to the environment. Absolutely. And you're probably seeing both sides of this, you know, obviously working in LA, but currently in Ohio, you're mm-hmm. seeing a little bit of this uh, polar opposite, right? And that yeah. mentality. <laughs> yes, maybe. it's very yeah. different. Mm-hmm. And the architecture here is so different. I'm looking around and I'm like, how so many peaks are all houses, so many dormers. Like it's just so different. And a lot, of, I see a lot of the modern farmhouse, you know, a lot of modern going up, um, so much contemporary. And um, I miss it. I miss that old, you know, the Midwest style. I think it's so charming here. Yeah. So are, how many homes are you guys doing in Malibu in the area? Are, like, are you are you just restoring homes that have been burnt down or, or what's what's building them from the ground up? Yeah. So right now we have in three, we have three projects over in that area with one in Malibu and two in Pacific Palisades. And then we have um, all most of our other jobs are in uh, Bel Air and Beverly Hills and Studio City. Yeah. One, one fun fact about Pacific Palisades is that, so my wife used to work out there actually, Mm -hmm. and the area around there is very rocky. Apparently the the ground, you know, obviously you can't uh, build tall structures if the ground's not suitable for it. Do you run into that problem? Even just with residential over there is the area? We just get the soil test, find out where we can build out. And then there are specific rules on how high the house can be built. One of our clients, he's like, can you just grade the property so you can take it down four feet so that we don't have to worry about the height issue? So that's one thing we did. Um, we're actually doing that for the Malibu house because they want a, t- a tall house, but it's like, just take out four feet of dirt. So they, they let us do that. <laughs> that's one way of getting around it. Yeah, I love that creative <laughs> idea there. <laughs> we we want to go up, but we need to go down first to yes. go up again. Yeah, yes. that's that's good. That's really good. <laughs> Um, so all of the construction that you're doing obviously costs money. How, yeah. how are you handling that conversation of costs? Cause I think there's, I, I'm unfortunately in today's day and age with the internet and kind of every piece of data at your fingertips, you know, somebody saying like, Oh, I just redid my kitchen for 10 grand. And it's like, but did you really pay 10 grand or, you know, maybe, can you share some of your experience with talking to customers about cost? Absolutely. Cost is always one of the top three things that people always ask about. It's it's one of their top three things. It's either specifications, cost, or timeline. And um, usually it's cost. It's number one. Um, So basically, I'll add, I hopefully you start with a design build company. I try to tell people, as many people as I can, meet your contractor first. They know the cost. They know exactly what it costs to build And then we will help you find an architect that's perfect for your style and your budget. And as long as, and as well as your engineer and everything else. So um, I'm finding that clients are really surprised by what things cost. And you're definitely going to expect it to spend on average $400 a square foot. If it's hillside, you're spending at least a thousand. And if you're really going to go all out, there really isn't a, a budget for square footage. It could be 4,000 a square foot if you're going to go really high end with it. If you're building a, like a, a pool on the hillside, I mean, you're spending a couple hundred thousand dollars just right there. But I mean, when they say it's $150 a square foot, do not believe them. You're going to pay for it one way or another. Either that contractor's not showing up after a couple of months or you're going to have change orders that are just crazy. So, um, you usually want to go, you don't want to go with the cheapest contractor. You want someone that's like in the middle. I, we're definitely never the cheapest. We're always in the middle um, somewhere. And um, I know it's hard to tell someone to do your research. I feel like when you do research online, I look at the numbers and I'm like, there's no way you can do a, a perfectly built bathroom for 15 grand. Like you just can't. Right. You're cutting the corner somewhere. Mm-hmm. You are. and. Yeah. There have been there have been jobs where I've um, given a bid to a client, and they're like, "You're just too high for me," I, and it's all about cost. And I've driven past two years later, and the same they're still working on the project. Mm. I would have had that job done in four months, and it would have been perfect. Right? Yeah, <laughs> the tra- are, the trade off of time there, right? You know, you're paying for it one way or another. And another example, another tip I could give clients is look at your contracts when you get the bids. Um, I had a client once, and this is a great example. The, another contractor was $200,000 less than me. 
But when you look at the contracts, there wasn't anything specified. This client in particular wanted a second story addition. They wanted to push out the first floor, kitchen remodel, three bath remodels, um, and living room facelift. There in no way in that other contractor's bid was even what kind of addition you were getting. They just gave them a number and they were making only 10% profit on the job. So you wow. have to look at that. What is your contractor charging you? Is he charging enough to stay on that job the whole time? That saved them a lot of money by only charging them 10% profit. We charge at least 30. It depends mm -hmm. on how big the job is and how like what's going on. But we charge enough where that crew is on that job every single day. So these are important things. Mm -hmm. It, do you disclose, I mean, when you're breaking that out in the bid or proposal for your clients, are you disclosing that up front with them, like just kind of showing price comparisons or how are you doing that? There are two different ways that I give a bid. One is my, my fee is included in every single thing, every line item. And sometimes I price it all out at my cost. And at the end, I'll put 30 or 40 percent and show them what I'm making. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the client's and the type of job that it is. But if it's already in the line items, I'm still pretty upfront about how much I'm charging. Sure. And yeah. as long as they understand what they're getting, that they're getting reliability, they're getting an entire staff that is available 24 seven. It's not a contractor that's working out of his own truck. It's, you can go to an office and have a meeting with staff. You know, have an interior designer working on your job site as long as well as us. I'm there every day. We obviously use Builder Trend um, as a management system. They're really getting a lot for um, you. Get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that absolutely. I think I think customers too are becoming more aware of that and the fact that there is a trade off there. And I think if you were to tell anybody, you know, hey, we're making thirty percent on this job, I don't think anybody would blink because it's like you've got you're providing a service, right? You've yeah. got you've got to get paid in this. There's yeah. obviously the hard cost that won't fluctuate. Uh, but you guys are bringing a lot to the table with your services, your design background, and just kind of mm -hmm. the overall value that you bring. Absolutely. I, I mean, I and no change orders. That's the, the biggest thing to me is I don't like change orders. I think what, what, the only thing is like, if I love a change order is great. If you're like, listen, I'm going to go with that big door that I wanted. You know, I'm going with the door. So that's great. Wonderful. But when it comes to, you know, the foundation or your framing pricing, like I don't want any big changes. And once we sign that contract, uh, hopefully just smooth sailing and we can just get through the job and do a beautiful job, make sure everyone's happy and be done with it. No surprise charges. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you, and maybe this is more common than we think, uh, than I think that you guys take two different pricing philosophies. Typically, as I found when you, when you work with a construction company, they either, they either do cost plus or fixed price. So you, you mm -hmm. just for probably internal, just this is how we do it. And we bid. So, yeah. um, can you speak to what, what about the prospects makes you sort of go, okay, I'm going to do this one fixed cost or this one, you know, cost plus. I don't want, I mean, I don't want to say, but clients that are really stick, like they're big sticklers on the line item, mm -hmm. you know, they're on a, even our billionaire clients have budgets, you know, and yeah. when they are really like tight with their budget, I will be even more transparent. I try to be as transparent as possible. Sure. But um, a lot of clients, they just like that, that it's already in there. They're yeah. more relaxed. They're like, okay, I understand what you're making off of this. Just let me know what everything is and, you know, sign the contract. But um, sometimes our fee is negotiable, but not, not really. Mm -hmm. Um, if anything, like our subs will help us out. They'll be like, okay, 10% discount on something. And then we can get some prices down. Mm -hmm. But, um, I would say that the, the client is really worried about budget is going to see what my fee is. Yeah. And, and so following that string. So when the actual confirm bids com are coming in from your subs and vendors and or their mm -hmm. bills, is everything available to the client to see? And you're just showing it the depends. Whole thing? That's a, mm -hmm. that's another kind of like an open contract yeah, like where open we get three yeah. top bids and mm -hmm. they can see everything. And then we put our fee on top of it. Mm -hmm. We typically do not do time and materials. I, I don't work hourly. That's mm -hmm. just not how we work. Um, you know, we, uh, we're a high end service and we've had a lot of experience and I feel that contractors that, you know, have the time and experience and they give that customer service, they deserve their, um, their fee. They deserve that fee. 
Yeah. Just interesting the different philosophies that businesses decide, and I'm sure it evolves as, as you grow as a business. Yeah. Um, all the different factors in there too and how you approach that. So it just sounds like you sort of make a decision based on um, making the project go as smooth as possible. And somebody who's going to be super de- yeah. de- detail oriented is just always going to be that way. So we might as well just get it out of the way now and just say, Hey, here's all, here's everything. Uh, and of somebody who, who may not uh, be as interested in the details and just the final result that another pricing philosophy might work for them. Yes, of course. And then, you know, we have a lot of celebrity clients and those clients need to know that they can trust us. Mm -hmm. And so everything from the beginning needs to be very transparent, especially that they need to know who's coming over there. They need to know um, everything. And, and, you know, they're already, you know, kind of worried about anything getting out. So I just Mm -hmm. feel like it's trust, first of all. I mean, no matter what, something is going to happen. You know, it's a construction project. It's very emotional, uh, it's dramatic, you know, you try your best. It's one of the most stressful things someone can do in their lives. So you just try to give them the best customer service you possibly can. And like you said, if you want customer service and you want the best companies, you have, you got to pay for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Sounds like great television, actually, all the drama that's involved. Right. And, you know. That's why there's so many TV shows. Yeah, right, exactly. So a lot of your clients, you would say are celebrities, it's really important that their privacy. So can you tell us about all the ones that you've had? <laughs> give, give us a top no, five and who your favorites are. And no. Some inside I, photos. Yeah, I, I, but um, it's, it's funny because we'll have subcontractors. They'll be like, was that so-and-so? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. Don't worry, I won't say anything. And I'm like, thank you. I appreciate there that. You go. But okay. I have worked on some homes right on the ocean. I'm just like, I just stare out their window, basically. Yeah. Um, it's just gorgeous. There's a couple homes. One home, uh, actually, I don't normally do this, but um, the realtor was a good friend of mine. They were trying to close, get this house sold. The, they had remodeled their kitchen and bath, and it was without permits. And so, you know what happens when the building department finds out that you didn't permit your, you know, a remodel. So basically I had to go through this entire process, getting the bathrooms and the, the kitchens permitted. And they were right across the street from the ocean. Like it was like house, street, ocean. And I just stared and I was like, oh, I love this view. I'm like, how could you even sell this house? Right. But yeah, it's fun. The codes, it's it's all L.A. building department. So it's not it's it's not any harder for me, usually the Santa Monica is really tough, um, especially with their green building. But I have a lot of friends and you you kind of have to like first like scare people in the building department. Like you're like, all right, I'm going to find out how to get around this or this is what my client wants and I better figure out how to get it. And then like once they realize, all right, you know what you're talking about, then everyone's super nice. And they're like, listen, if you just pay $5,000, you can add 10% more square footage to your remodel. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Sounds like a deal. Like, just throw money at the issue. You exactly. go there. It's like I feel like you're an attorney. You just have to kind of know where the rules are and where you can get around them. Sure, relationships <laughs> are important in building. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and this is a really unique. <laughs> it's a really unique industry too. Like you have to wear so many hats, which is which is interesting. And also, you know, being a woman in the industry, there's not many, quite honestly, in this industry, specifically in construction, uh, that are owners of businesses or even you know play play a, a, a vital part. role. Yeah. So, you know, what's your take on that? Oh, when I first started, it used to like make me so insecure. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm the only girl that they've probably ever seen on a construction site, let mm-hmm. alone selling them a project. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I feel like the more I got to know my stuff, um, the more I could tell them about their plans, the better it was. They were just like, oh, you know your stuff. Like, it's not even a problem. And I think I bring a lot. I, I care a lot. I think that's just like a, something a woman does. I, I come in there and construction is already nostalgic for me because I grew up around it. And so I really care that they're going to be put out as far as the work. My guys are going to be in there mm-hmm. working. Mm-hmm. Um, I want their home to really suit their personality and their needs. And I think that comes across when I meet them. And they, they're like hugging me after I leave. They're like, oh, my gosh, this is great. I feel so comfortable. And I'm like, good. OK, I'm happy. And And I just don't see it as. A problem anymore I, I used to but now i'm like i don't think gender even matters yeah, That's yeah it's good. getting it's yeah. getting a lot better i mean i think people speak to it a lot i mean there's there's definitely a shortage in just general um construction work right now and so yeah. uh the more and more of anybody who can come in would be great and diver- diversification is important so 
I mean, it's good. I mean, it's good that you see it as an advantage. That's that's a great way to look at it. hundred percent. It is for sure. It's great yeah. that women are coming in, and and if there's any female architects or engineers out there listening, I'm looking for you. There you go. There you start go. A, start, hey, start a little group. Start yeah, a group. That's good. We we'll get a networking group. Find me, please. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell when a man's um, done a flip. Uh, you know things like that. I'm sorry. There are some amazing male designers out there, but. <laughs> I have so many homes out there that are flipped homes and I come in and have to remodel the whole thing. And they're like, why is everything done in gray? Mm. And why does the laundry room over here? But my bedrooms are up here. I'm like, because a man who doesn't do the laundry designed the house. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, well, we'll make sure we put a link in the show notes to your company's website, your Instagram page. And uh, again, reach out to Christine listeners if you are interested in working with her, all those females yeah. out there, the female architects, especially. Yeah. So, yes. absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming on and uh, enjoy the rest of your holiday season in Ohio. Maybe, yeah. you get, maybe you'll get some snow. I, I'm, oh, I'm hoping I for some so. still. Yeah. <laughs> it's never too late. And the nice thing for you is that you have looking forward to going back to LA. Exactly. Got, you can here. leave the snow. Yeah. We're just here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I get to go back to the sunshine. That's good. <laughs> thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. I thank you so great. much. Thanks so much. <laughs> Love what you heard? Don't forget to rate and subscribe to our podcast so you can hear from more guests that will benefit your business. Also, please check out our show notes page for more information on what we discussed on this episode. You can find it at buildertrend.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on The Building Code. Appreciate you.